Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm a grateful member of Al-Anon, and my name is Angie. My home group is the Al-Anon Family Group in Destin, Florida. I bring you greetings from our group and hope that uh, any time you're down south that you would stop in and visit with us. We love it when visitors come. I knew Thursday night when I went to the early bird meeting, and I think there was at least 100 people there, I knew that I was in a very special place. And that has certainly proven to be true the longer that I stay here. Thank you to the committee and those responsible for my being here. Thank you to Reagan. She's been just a delightful host. Thank you, Mike, for doing the the absolutely uh, essential task of helping to spread the good news of recovery. And thank you to all of you for being here today. I heard someone say one time that Al-Anon is all about relationships, and I would agree with that, but I would also have to say that for me, Al-Anon has also been about miracles, which are defined as profound events that occur, and about hope as well. My dad was in the military, so that meant that I was uh, either getting ready to move, planning to move, packing up my stuff to move, moving or unpacking, Uh, and that was just the way of life for us. My dad was not an alcoholic. He truly was a social drinker. I can remember a few times in my life seeing him a little bit tipsy, and he would always come home from a military event, and he would be so happy And he would go to the telephone and get his address book out and call all of his old military buddies, and they would reminisce over the telephone. And I loved it when that happened because my father talked very, very little about his experiences in the military. So I was able to get a glimpse of that as he would um, share stories with his old buddies from from the Army. My mother was an alcoholic. And uh, she was quite a raging alcoholic toward me, so a lot of my growing up years were pretty tumultuous with her. I have a brother seven years older than than I am, and he is a math and science genius. He's won a lot of awards, state awards, national awards for things to do with math and science, had a career in hospital administration, uh, and also was a, a wonderful athlete. He was quarterback on the football team and pitcher on the baseball team and forward on the basketball team and president of the golf league. And if it, and if it had a ball involved in it, he did it, and he excelled at pool shark bar none. Oh, my goodness, could he play pool. Uh, and then there was me, and I lived my life in books. I have loved reading ever since I learned the alphabet. I still love to read today, but I hope I don't use it so much as an escape the way I did growing up. You see, I learned being an Army brat that if I said hello to you, that meant I would have to say goodbye to you. And I did not like saying goodbye, so it didn't take long before I rarely said hello. And I just lived in books, and I could love the people in those books and the places in those books and the things that happened in those books, and I never had to leave them. And that was my family, and we looked really, really good on the outside. And on the inside, we were, we were really like four islands. Each of us lived on our own individual island, and from time to time we would come together. But most of the time, we just lived on our own individual islands. Of course, growing up in that family, there came a time that the opposite sex became quite attractive to me. And this is what he was like at that time. I can be in a room of 500 people. There can be one alcoholic. (laughs) Yeah. The heavens open up, the angelic chorus sings, and the sunbeams and moonbeams shine down on that young man. And I will tell you, this room is glowing right now. Glowing. And I love it. I love it. I love alcoholics. I love al I just love them. My sponsor said one time, Angie, you're always going to be attracted to alcoholics. And I said, oh, wow. And she said, it's okay. You just have to learn to stick with the winners. Just learn to stick with the winners. And I'm glad that that's a piece of advice that I really took to heart. And I have loved sticking with the winners uh, in this program. This is also what he was like. He'd walk in a room and people would say, oh, look, he's here, he's here. Boy, could he tell a story. He could tell a story and have you believe anything. Weave a pretty tale. He kind of liked living life on the edge. He liked doing things that were kind of risky, like maybe 
driving motorcycles fast or skydiving or race car driving or just I love that living life on the edge kind of thing. Knew what to tell a woman, what to say to a woman, how to say it to a woman. Also had been either physically and or sexually and or emotionally abused growing up. Either physically and or sexually and or emotionally abused the women that he was involved with. Didn't know how to express any emotion except anger and expressed it very inappropriately. Had no idea how to communicate. And you know, it was many years before I realized one day that he was me. He was me. You see, that's who I was too. I have much more in common with alcoholics than I do differences. In addition, I would lie just as easily as I could tell the truth. Sometimes I would lie and I would think, why did you lie about that? There was no reason to lie about that. But I would lie. I knew if I could just control the world and everybody in it, we would all be so much better off. (laughs) So much better off. I knew how to manipulate. I knew how to get my way. I knew how to create chaos because, you see, I was bored with normal. I didn't like normal. I loved drama. And if there wasn't drama going on, I knew how to make it. And then I knew how to make you feel responsible for it, and you would end up apologizing to me because you had created it. I could castrate or crucify you with the words that would come out of my mouth, and I could push you in a corner with my words and make you feel like you had no way out. I'm not proud of that woman, and you know that woman is still part of who I am today. But because of the transformative nature of the program that I practice, I don't have to be that woman. I don't have to be her today, and I don't have to be her tomorrow, and I don't have to be her the next day. So his wounded heart would call out to my tortured soul and we would join hands together and we would march off into the sunset to live happily ever after. And for me, it just never worked. It just didn't work. Short-term marriages, short-term relationships, they just didn't work. In 1978, I was living in a little town in South Alabama. I know you can't believe I've lived a lot in the South. Um, (laughs) And it was called Andalusia. And I was in a musical. And the name of the musical was Carousel. And I played the Lady of the Evening. And, of course, those sunbeams and moonbeams shone down on the villain whose name was Paul. Paul took me out, and on the way home that night, this is what I heard him say. I heard him say, Angie, I'm going to an AA meeting Saturday night. Would you like to go with me? Now, we talked about that night in that conversation many years later. And what he actually said was, Angie, I'm an alcoholic, and I'm going to an AA meeting Saturday night. Would you like to go with me? I know that's what he said because I trust Paul. But you see, I never heard him say, I'm an alcoholic. That's how denial works in my life. I hear what I want to hear, and I see what I want to see. I didn't want to hear those words, so I didn't hear them. The week rocked on. My mother said, what are you going to do this weekend? I said, well, I'd love it if you'd babysit Amanda. Amanda's my daughter, the the best thing that came out of my my first marriage. And uh, she said, sure. And she said, where are you going? I said, well, I'm going to an AA meeting. She said, well, what is AA? I said, well, I don't know, but at this time I drove dirt track race cars for fun. So I said, AAA is about cars, so I guess AA is about cars too. (laughs) So Saturday night rolls around. Paul picks me up. We drive about 20 minutes to another South Alabama town called Op Alabama, and we pull into a church parking lot, and I thought, this is a strange place to have a meeting about cars. (laughs) We walk inside, and Paul says, now we're going over here, and he gestured to the right. And he said, and you're going over here, and he gestured to the left. And when I turned to the left, I saw a woman that I see as clearly today as I did that night in 1978. Her name was Miss Ina. She had on a royal blue silk dress that belted at the waist. She had on black patent leather high heel shoes. She had on her hose. She had her jewelry on. This was 1978, so her hair was way up high and a bouffant hairdo with curls everywhere. She had her glasses on a chain around her neck. And she held out her hand to me, and she said, Honey, you come with me. And I went with her, and that was my first Al-Anon meeting. Now, I cannot tell you one thing that was said that night. You know, sometimes great events happen in our lives, but we don't realize that they're a great event. And that's the way that night was for me. But I can tell you she gave me this one day at a time book, and I can tell you that I knew I was home. She patted my hand that whole meeting because I just cried. I just cried. On the way home that night, Paul said, well, how did you like the meeting? I said, oh, I loved it. I said, but I don't think I can go back. And he said, why not? And I said, well, I don't know any alcoholics. <laughs> now, bear in mind, by this time I've been married to several. My great uncles were all alcoholic. My favorite uncles were alcoholic. My favorite aunt was alcoholic. My mother was alcoholic. But you see, to me, it was Uncle Vernon. It was Aunt Mud. It was Uncle Cecil. 
It was my mother. I didn't associate the behaviors they exhibited with the disease of alcoholism at that time. And I don't know about here, but in 1978 in South Alabama, Al-Anon was made up of women who were married to men who went to AA and that were meeting in the room right next door. And that's what Al-Anon was. And, you know, that's not who I was. So while I identified strongly with the message, I didn't really identify with the messengers. I'm so grateful today that Al-Anon is made up of all kinds of people. All kinds of us get to go. So I would go to Al-Anon a little bit, and then I'd run out there and make some more chaos, and I'd come back and learn just enough to be dangerous and run out there and make some more chaos. And, and I did that repeatedly until June 15, 1990, when I finally said, Angie, you are so blessed. You are so blessed, honey. You know, most people never find our rooms. I read an interview last year that Lois was involved with, and she said that was a big concern she had, that we were going to be so anonymous people wouldn't be able to find us. She said, you know, people will read about the, the drunks getting DUIs and the accidents happening in the newspaper, but I'm so afraid they're not going to get to read about the good news of recovery. I worry about that too sometimes. Uh, but that's how it was. So I said, you get to go. And, you know, most people that come don't stay. You get to stay, Angie. You get to stay and be part of and share and learn and grow. You get to go to meetings. How awesome is that? So since June 15, 1990, that's who I've been. Excited about recovery, happy to go to recovery, happy to be involved in recovery, and happy to be able to experience the miracles and profound events that have happened in my life and in the lives of countless other people that I've been able to meet on this journey. Um, one, one, one neat one that happened to my, to my husband and I just, just a few years ago, we have uh, an, an unofficial adopted son now, and I've never had a son, so I get to have a son, and he's in recovery, and this weekend, we're having our roundup back where I live, and he's the voice of the roundup, uh, and it's awesome, and it never would have happened without these rooms, without the rooms of recovery. Early one morning in 1991, I woke up, and I called my two best friends, and I said, I'm going to Tuscaloosa today to see what's going on with Amanda. Would you like to go with me? You see, that cute little girl had grown up now, and she was going to the University of Alabama. She played the Million Dollar Band, and I had not heard from her in three months, and that was very unusual because we were close, and we stayed in good communication with each other. By now, I've been back in al for about a year, and I'm really trying to work this program. So I'm waiting for God to let me know what to do. And when I woke up that morning, I knew it was the day to go. My friends said they would go with me. I picked them up. We lived in South Alabama, about a four-hour drive to Tuscaloosa, way up North Alabama, and away we went. And on the way, my friends said, what are we going to do when we get there? And I said, you know, God's going to let us know what to do. And I don't know about you, but there are times in my life, if I'm doing the deal, if I'm living this program the way I know I need to, if I'm being of service to God and my fellows, if I'm working with my sponsor and working with sponsees and trying to walk a spiritual path, there are times that God truly does for me what I cannot do for myself. And pretty much that whole day was that kind of day. We got to Tuscaloosa. We got to the apartment complex where she lived, got out of the car, and there was mail laying all over the ground. And I walked over and started picking it up. And all the mail had my daughter's name on it. So we gathered up the mail, and we put it in the back seat of the car and went to the door and knocked. Nobody answered. I said, I'm going to go get the apartment manager to come open up the apartment. And Melody said, I'll stay here. And Bretta said, I'll go with you. So away we go, and we're going downstairs. And Melody calls out, and she says, Angie, Angie, she's here. And I turned around and walked back, and there was my daughter standing in the doorway. And I walked up to her, and I hugged her, and I said, Amanda, I love you, and it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. We walked inside, sat down, talked for a few minutes, and then I said, Amanda, I want you to know that I'm here to make you an offer. And I remember thinking at the time, wow, I wonder what the offer's going to (laughs) be. And I said, I know something's wrong. I don't know what it is. But I know something's wrong. And I thought, that's good. And then I said, and I want you to know that I'm here to do whatever I have to do to help you. I'm willing to take you wherever I need to take you. I'm willing to pay whatever I need to pay. I'm willing to do whatever I need to do to help. And in my mind, I was like, yay, that's good. And then I said, but you know, the offer is only good for today. And boy, I just screamed out in my mind, don't do this, Angie. I said, if you accept the offer, great. If you don't, that's okay, too. I'm still going to love you. I'm still going to be your mother. I'm still going to care about you. We'll still do things together. But I will never make you this offer again. 
And then I really screamed out in my mind, Angie, don't do this. And then I said, and the offer's only good for an hour. Well, you can imagine. I really screamed then, no, don't do this to your daughter. And I stood up. We all stood up. And I left and gave her an hour to make up her mind. And when I came back, I had cried that whole hour because I knew she was not going to accept that offer. We got back and walked in, sat down, talked for a minute, and, and Amanda said, Mama, I accept your offer. And I said, okay. And you know, my mind was just a blank. It was just a blank. And a name came to me of a therapist in way down South Alabama on the other side of the state from Dothan. And I went to the phone and called information and got her phone number and called and she answered the phone, and I told her who I was and a little bit about what was going on, and she said, uh, well, maybe your daughter has a mental illness. And I said, maybe she does. By this time, Amanda had told me she'd written a few bad checks, and I said, maybe she does. I knew a little bit about mental illness, and I thought, you know, if she does, we can get her some good therapy, maybe get her some medicine for a little while, and she'll be okay. So the therapist said, I'll call you back, and the end result was that I had to have Amanda at Providence Hospital in South Alabama in Mobile at 9 o'clock the next morning, and, and that's where we were. I met her psychiatrist. His name was Dr. Thomas. He has since gone on to that great meeting in the sky. And Dr. Thomas said, what do you think's wrong with your daughter? I said, well, she's written a few bad checks. He said, maybe she's got a mental illness. I said, maybe she does. At that time at Providence Hospital, they had a unit of the hospital, and half the unit was for people who had alcohol and drug issues, and the other half was for people who had issues with mental illness. So they put Amanda on the people that had issues with mental illness. And every weekend I would go see her. She stayed there two months, and I would go see her every weekend. And every weekend she would tell me serious, very serious things about things that had happened to her in her life. Some dramatic things, some things I was totally shocked about that had happened to her. But for me, the most difficult thing and the most difficult weekend was when she told me that she was an alcoholic. You see, I had been running from the disease of alcoholism and to the disease of alcoholism all of my life. And I knew I had a decision to make that day. Was I going to run from Amanda, or was I going to run to her? When I got home that day, I took step one in a way that I'd never taken it before. I knew my life was unmanageable. I could see the unmanageability all around me. But I did not want to admit I was powerless. I don't know why. I don't know. I don't know why. But, oh, I just clung to that. You know, I did not want to let go of that. But that day I did. I admitted I was powerless. I went to the meeting Tuesday night, and I asked Debbie to be my sponsor, and we dove into the steps in a way that I had never done before. Step two was easy for me. I had always known that there was a God. I always knew there was something greater than me out there. I had no doubt about that. And I tried to just live my life kind of under the radar of God, just right under his radar, because I believed if he ever truly saw me, he would not want someone like me who had done the things that I had done to be on this beautiful earth that he had created. So I just skimmed along under his radar. So, of course, step three was harder for me because now I'm expected to make a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of this God that I've been skating under the radar of. But I figured out a way to do that. When I worked the steps, I worked them the way they had been worked with my sponsor, Debbie. And so I had a packet, and I had a lot of stuff to read, and I had 12 questions to answer about every question and a lot of books to read. And I'd meet her at the clubhouse, and we'd do every step. So I met her there for step three, and I answered all those 12 questions. And this is how I figured out how to get around it. I said to myself, I'm going to make a decision to turn my will and my life over one day. I'm going to do that one day. And, you know, I met Debbie, and I did all those answers to all those 12 questions, and I never told her I was saying, one day. I'm so grateful for a strong arm of my al lineage on that tree. Uh, this, this limb of the tree goes like this. It goes from Lois to Arbutus in Texas, and from Arbutus in Texas to Lou Bell in Little Rock, Arkansas, and from Lou Bell in Little Rock to Mary Pearl in Little Rock, and from Mary Pearl in Little Rock to Debbie in Enterprise, and from Debbie in Enterprise to Angie. And you know, when Arbutus was spreading the good news of al in Texas, all they had was the big book and later the 12 and 12. Thank you, Alcoholics Anonymous, for providing us with our foundational text. And as our wonderful al literature has been written and, and published and produced, we use all that wonderful al literature, but in my lineage, we also use the big book and the 12 and 12, as was started. So when I finished step three, Debbie said, Angie, you're going to go home, and when you get up in the morning, you're going to say the third step prayer out of the big book, and you'll say it every day for the rest of your life. 
And when I did step seven, she added that prayer on as well. So the next morning I got up and I said the third step prayer. And as you know, it starts, God, I offer myself to thee. And it wasn't one day. It wasn't one day. There was no way I could get around it anymore. And I knew God was seeing me. For a long time I said that prayer in the, in the shower every morning because I would just cry. Because I truly believed that he was just going to kill me. I really did. You see, that's the pain I was in. I always try to remember that as I work with sponsees today. I would have done whatever Debbie told me to do. Finally, there came a time I quit crying when I said that prayer, and then there came a time I started singing it. And Now, most days I sing it. At the end of the third and seventh step prayer, I say, God, what mission have you got for us today? Let's get on with it. When I finished that third step, Debbie handed me a packet, and she said, this is your four-step inventory. And I said, oh, no, I've got this study guide over here, and I've already read the whole thing, even though you told me not to work ahead, and I know how I'm going to answer all the questions and do it. And she said, well, you're going to do that. But you're also going to do this, 30 pages front and back, single space, nothing but question after question after question about my life. Well, she gave me that right before the meeting, so I'm over there at my spot and I'm going through those pages. Because you see, I think most of us have maybe a thing or two that we've said we're never going to tell. I sure did. And you know, I'd always rationalized and justified why I never had to tell it. So I'm going through there looking. And I'm already bargaining with God, and I'm telling God. Now, God, I know I'm not supposed to tell Debbie. I know I'm not supposed to tell her. See, I'm already on five and hadn't started four. I know I'm not supposed to tell her. But just in case I'm supposed to tell her, the question's going to be in this packet, and it's going to say exactly, da-da-da-da-da-da-da, period. It's not going to say da dee da dee da dee or da 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 It's going to say exactly, da-da-da-da-da-da-da, period. And if it's not there, say it just that way. I know I'm not supposed to tell her. Well, about three-fourths of the way through that packet, about halfway down that page, there it was. Da 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 period. And I said, oh, God, I'm going to have to tell her. I'm going to have to tell her. The dad did step five. I I got to the clubhouse before Debbie, and uh, I watched her drive up, and I watched her get out of the car, and I watched her walk up to me, and I watched her walk in front of me. I watched how she sat down. Because, you see, I knew when we got to that question, our relationship was going to be forever changed. So we dove in and started, she would ask the question, I would answer. We were going through that packet, and we finally got to that question. And she asked the question, and I answered it, and I started crying. And she came over, and I was sitting down, and she stood over me, and she just hugged me. And I felt something on top of my head, and it was her tears. And, you know, in that moment, the shame and the guilt that I felt about that was gone. I still felt responsible for it. I need to feel responsible for all the actions of my life. But the shame and the guilt were just killing me. They were just killing me. And it was gone. And you know, Debbie and my relationship was forever changed that day. We were closer than we had been before I did step five. Six and seven, I did like I think a lot of people do. I went somewhere quiet and prayed for an hour. And then I kind of waited for God to do the deal. Well, my God does the deal If I do the deal, so I have to do my part. And I probably have grown more with six and seven than any of the other steps for me. Three books over the years have really helped me tremendously. One is Drop the Rock. The other is The Ripple Effect, which is the sequel to Drop the Rock. And the last book is Steps and Stories by Sandy Beach. And those three books really changed my world when it comes to steps six and seven. So Amanda was in that treat was in that treatment center. They just the day she admitted she was alcoholic, they just moved her from the side of the unit for people that had a mental illness to the side of the unit for people that had issues with alcohol or drugs. And so when I went to pick her up, I had a contract for her to look at. And I had written the contract. And I wrote it because I come from a long line of martyrs. You know, woe is me, look at all I've done for you, all that. And I didn't want to be that person anymore. So that's why I wrote the contract. And on the contract for everything Amanda agreed to do, I agreed to do something. And it kind of went like this. I agreed to buy groceries. She had to agree to cook three nights a week. I agreed she could stay with me. She had to agree to pay $100 a month rent. I agreed that I would not have men spend the night overnight in our home. She agreed she wouldn't have men spend the night overnight in our home. And by this time, I've gone through all that mail and made a few phone calls and learned that Amanda had written quite a number of bad checks and and for the amount she'd written was facing at least 15 years at Tutwiler Prison for Women in Alabama. And I paid all that off, and the contract said that Amanda had 10 years to pay that money back to me 
or she would go to Tutwiler Prison for Women. She paid me back in eight years. Uh, so that was the contract, and it, there were lots of things like that. And I need to mention here that anybody I talk about in my story has given their approval for me to do that. And if Amanda was here, she would tell you. She looked at that contract, and she thought, hmm, mama or jail? Mama or jail? <laughs> she said she had to think about that. Uh, but she did pick me, and she signed the contract, and away we went to learn how to be a family in recovery. And I'll, I'll share a couple of really quick things. Um, Amanda had been living with me several months, and I came home one day, and she came home, and she said, Mama, you know I've been doing everything you want me to do. I've got all these part-time jobs, and I'm working hard, and i got a sponsor, and I'm going to meetings, and I'm doing all this stuff, and I'm just, I'm doing it all, Mama, I'm doing the deal, but I just don't think I'm going to have the rent money tomorrow. You know how hard I've been working and everything I've been doing, and I'll get it to you as soon as I can, but I just don't think I'm going to have it tomorrow. So I said, well, honey, you're absolutely right. You have been doing everything and more. I am so proud of you. I hope you're proud of yourself. You've been doing great, just great since you got here. But, you know, I went and talked to the Salvation Army before you came, and they told me I could drop you off at any point, and they would give you two hots and a cot. So when I get home tomorrow, if the rent money's not on the table, have all your stuff packed, and anything you, anything you want, you better take, because whatever you leave here is going to be mine. I'm still going to love you. I'm still going to care about you. I'm still going to be your mother. We're still going to do things together. But I'm going to take to the Salvation Army and drop you off, and you'll never be able to live with me again, because you will have broke our contract. Well, you can imagine her eyes were big as dinner plates, you know. And so I got up and went to the went in the bathroom, got in the shower, and I just cried and cried and cried because I knew I could do that. I knew I could. You see, there were some times in Amanda's life that I would say things to her that I wouldn't say to the checkout clerk at the grocery store. There were times I would use a ton of voice with her that I wouldn't use with a teller at the bank. There were times I'd shrug my shoulders or roll my eyes or do other gestures, you know, that I wouldn't do to, do to a stranger that I'm sitting next to on a plane. And I didn't want to do that anymore. And I really believed that day that I could see Amanda as a woman deserving of respect and dignity. Deserving of respect and dignity. And, you know, if any of us in this room had a contract together and one of us broke it, there would be consequences for that. And Amanda was deserving of that same respect and dignity as any of us are. A lady came up to me one time. She said, your daughter might be deserving of that, but my son doesn't. She said, He's, he vomits and stinks. He's thrown up in my car and he's stolen from us. He doesn't deserve anything. And I said, no, ma'am, you are so wrong. I said, he deserves to be treated with respect and dignity, if for no other reason than because he's a precious child of God. A precious child of God. When I got home the next day, the rent money was on the table, and it was there every month until Amanda moved out. Another thing I learned that I still learn today goes like this. If my name's not in the sentence, it is none of my business. And i tell you how that works. Sometimes I would say to Debbie, God, I wonder if Amanda's going to her meetings. And Debbie would say, Angie, your name is not in that sentence. So then I would say, God, I wonder if Amanda, Angie's daughter, is going to her meetings. <laughs> Debbie would say, no, you cannot do that. You can't do that. <laughs> These are also sentences that don't have my name. Is Amanda working her steps? Does Amanda have a sponsor? Is Amanda being a valued member of Alcox Anonymous? Is Amanda leading a spiritual life? Is Amanda being of service to God and her fellows? And as the years have gone on, is Amanda being a wonderful wife? Is Amanda being a precious mother to those awesome grandkids I have? And on and on and on and on. My name's in none of those sentences. But here are some sentences that do have my name. Is Angie going to her meetings? Does Angie have a sponsor? Is Angie working her steps? Is Angie being of service to God and her fellows? Is Angie being a kind mother? Is Angie being a loving wife? Is Angie being an awesome grandmother to those grandchildren? And on and on and on and on. You see, I learned that my name was in enough sentences that I really didn't have time left over to worry about those that didn't have my name. Uh, Amanda celebrated 28 years in Alcoholics Anonymous last year thanks to rooms like this and people like you and the program of recovery that she practices, the God of her understanding. She has a wonderful husband and two beautiful grandchildren. Uh, she lives in Montgomery, Alabama. She speaks sometimes. She's an active, active member of her home group. And I know all those things because people tell me, not because I ask. Uh, and I love her dearly. I love her dearly. Late one night in 1994, my phone rang, and the voice said, Do you blame me because Amanda's alcoholic? And I said, what? And the voice said, do you blame me because Amanda's alcoholic? And I realized that it was Amanda's father, whose nickname is Slim. And I had not heard from him in a long, long time. 
And so we talked a minute, and I said, no, Slim, I don't blame you. I said, you didn't cause her alcoholism. You can't cure her alcoholism, and you can't control her alcoholism, the three C's of Al-Anon. And he said, what? I said, you didn't cause her alcoholism. You can't cure her alcoholism, and you can't control her alcoholism. And he said, okay, and he hung up. <laughs> a few weeks later, early one morning, my phone rang, and the voice said, I'm coming to Dothan. And I said, okay, and I hung up. I called Debbie, my sponsor, and this is what I said. Oh, my God, Debbie Slim just called. He said he's coming to Dothan. He's coming to get sober. I don't know what to do. I think he's supposed to use Cairo syrup, but I'm not really sure. I think I've heard that from the old-timer before. <laughs> Debbie said, wait a minute. What happened? I said, well, Slim called. She said, what did he say? I said, well, he said, I'm coming to Dothan. She said, Ann. I said, I said, well, I said, okay. She said, and I said, well, we hung up. She said, Angie, how do you get all that stuff you just said to me from I'm coming to Dothan? <laughs> And I said, because he knows that we're in recovery and we have alcohol and drug-free homes, and I know that's why he's coming. So then Debbie said, oh, my God, I think you do use carol syrup, but I think you use beer, too, but I'm not sure about the ratio. We're going to have to find out what to do. And, oh, here you go. You've got these two al women trying to figure out how you sober up an alcoholic. And at one point I said, I don't think we were supposed to be doing this. And the day rocked on, and finally, about mid-afternoon, my daughter's sponsor, Gloria, called, and she said, honey, don't you know any doctors? And I said, well, yeah. She said, well, call one. <laughs> so I said, okay. So I got the phone book out. And for some of y'all, a phone book is what we used to have that had a lot of phone numbers in it with people's names. So I turned to the section that said physicians, and I went down the list till I saw a doctor's name I knew. And I'd call the, name out of the, phone, call the number out of the phone book, and guess what? The doctor answered the phone. I talked a little bit to him, and he said, I'm going to call you in some medicine, give it to him just like candy for three days. He'll be okay. I said, okay. Finally, at 10 o'clock that night, Slim called, and he'd gotten to Clanton, Alabama. He was hitchhiking from Tennessee to South Alabama, and he'd gotten to Clanton, which was about three hours north of me. And he said, I can't come any further, and I said, I'll come pick you up. And that was really good because, you see, I had a three-hour drive in the days that we didn't have cell phones. And I had a three-hour conversation with God because I was a little bit concerned at God. You see, by now I'm saying, God, what mission have you got for us today? But I didn't anticipate this mission. I didn't want this mission. I did not volunteer for this mission. And, you know, I learned that day that I don't get to volunteer for the mission. My job is to suit up and show up and be ready and do a really good job for God. So we had a serious discussion because the last time Slim and I were under the same roof, it had been very, very violent. And here I was going to get this man and bring him to my safe place. When I got to Clanton, Alabama to pick him up, I probably need to mention here that when Slim and I were married, he was tall, good-looking, clean-cut, short hair. But after we divorced, he joined a very, very well-known motorcycle gang where he was very, very successful. So what I picked up had hair down to his waist, a beard down to his waist, leathers and chains and tattoos. I didn't even know what they meant. And he got in the car and slung his duffel bag in the back seat, and away we went. We were about an hour from Montgomery, and I said, Slim, I said, we're about an hour from Montgomery, and I know there's alcohol in that duffel bag. I want you to know the alcohol is going to stay in Montgomery. You can stay with it, or you can leave it there and come with me, and if you leave it there and come with me, I'm going to do everything I can to help you get sober. It's up to you. He left the alcohol in Montgomery, and away we went. And when we got home, I proceeded to learn about the degradation and deprivation and demoralization of the disease of alcoholism. And that's why I tell this story. You see, I've been in al now for some years. And I would say, I know alcoholism is, is a disease. I know it is. There's no doubt. I'm, a, I'm sure of it. But, you know, sometimes when I'd be at, night, at home at night by myself or I'd be driving in my car or I'd just be thinking, you know, thinking, thinking, <laughs> I'd start thinking, mm, I'm not sure. I'm just not sure it's a disease. I've heard some people say they just quit drinking. I've heard some people say they just go to church. I'm just not sure. I feel so blessed today to be able to stand here and tell you I'm certain with every fiber of my being that alcoholism is a disease. For that 72 hours, that first three days, you know, he couldn't sleep, so I didn't sleep. And I was afraid to give him those pills like candy. I gave them to him, but he had a pretty rough detox. And he took me on his journey of alcoholism. The apartment was the stench of vomit and feces and sweat was everywhere. I was washing sheets every four or five hours, and I went on that journey. And I know today that anytime, anywhere on this earth, a person says, I love you, 
and I promise you, I'll never do it again. I know they mean that with everything inside of them. But I also know what a cunning, baffling, and powerful disease alcoholism is. At that time at my home group in Level Plains, Alabama, every Sunday night, we had a joint AA and Al-Anon candlelight gratitude meeting. This couple came up to me recently and said, oh, I wish we did something like that. I wish we did. And I said, well, I don't know what's happened. I said, AAs and Al-Anons, we used to do all kinds of things together. We used to do recovery weekends together at the lake. We'd run a house and we'd all go and you wouldn't know who was who. And we had potlucks and we used to do all kinds of stuff. And they said, oh, I wish we could do that. And I said, well, you can just, in, just invite some people over to your house, some AAs and al and get together or go bowling. You can do that. So I called Debbie that Sunday morning. I said, I'm bringing Slim to the meeting tonight. She said, you've told me he can't walk. I said, he can't, but I'm going to drag him to the car, and I'm bringing him, and I did. <laughs> and when I turned off the main highway, there's about two blocks to that little red brick building there in, in Level Plains, and when I turned off the main highway and looked down, I could see cars. You see, the word had gone out that morning that Amanda's dad had come to get sober. And there were people there from Alabama and Florida and Georgia, and they had all come to welcome Slim into the fellowship. And we got inside, and it was packed. There were people everywhere. And there was one seat left, and that was between Amanda's sponsor and her grand sponsor, a little white-headed lady named Miss Peggy. And Miss Peggy held up her hand to 6'5 Slim, and she said, Honey, you come sit by me. And he did, and he got a white chip that night, and he celebrated 25 years sober last year, uh, thanks to rooms like this and people like you. And he's, uh, this year, he's, he uh, got a really serious illness and was, and was very, very sick for several weeks, and, and he passed away earlier this week. But you know, the last 25 years, he was able to live pretty much the way he wanted to live those years, thanks to rooms like this and people like you. My mother never did get in recovery. She uh, had severe COPD and emphysema the last couple years of her life, so she could not drive to get the alcohol, so she didn't have any. Uh, but she wasn't in recovery. And, you know, for, for, those, for that time, two or three weeks out of the month, she would stay with me, and two weeks out of the month, she would stay with my daughter. And usually three weekends of the month, I would take her to her home in Andalusia where she could be at her house. And I could never have done that if it were not for the rooms of Al-Anon and Open AA. You see, I was raised going to Open AA meetings, to conferences, to roundups, to whoopee parties, to all that stuff. My sponsor said, go, do, learn, experience, and I did. And in doing that, I watched you, and I saw how you related to each other, and I heard your stories, and I learned how to be a loving mother from watching and hearing things that you did. I learned how to be a loving sister. I learned how to accept love from a man that wasn't sexual. I didn't know there was such a thing. I learned how to let people love me that were not going to hurt me and were not going to abandon me. I didn't know that was possible. I learned all that from being in these rooms and from being with you, and I continue to learn today. My mother was on my couch, and we were talking, and she said, I know you talk about me when you speak, and at that time I really didn't. I really didn't talk about her. And I said, so I said, no, ma'am, I really don't. And she said, well, I know you do. And I said, no, ma'am, I don't. And I thought, where is this going? And then she said, well, I know you talk about when I used to beat you. And, you know, my heart just about stopped because we had never talked about that. And I did not want to talk about that. And I said, no, ma'am, I don't talk about that. And then she said, well, you know, I didn't beat you every day. And I thought, wow, we're here. We're here. And so I turned around and looked at her, and I said, no, ma'am, you didn't beat me every day. But, you know, you beat me many days. And one day was one day too many. And then what happened to me happened to uh, a, a speaker that I heard one time when she said that she believed God gave her the ability to see her mom one day the way she thought God saw her mother. And that happened to me that day. And as I looked at my mother... This is what I saw. I saw this tiny, frail, 84-year-old woman who most of my life had been 60 feet tall. I saw this woman tethered to, a, to an oxygen tank. She couldn't go anywhere or do anything without dragging this thing that she despised everywhere she went. I saw a stoic woman, a strong woman, a hard woman who had lived her life behind a 100-foot concrete wall where nothing could get in and nothing could get out. I saw a woman who was a country girl, for, just raised in the country, and she married this, 
this army officer and was whisked away to the life of an army officer's wife. I still have her book, uh, Officer's Wife. It's a huge military book that told her how to live that life. And she lived that life wonderfully well. She was a fantastic officer's wife. She was beautiful and elegant and everything that she needed to be. She was whoever she needed to be with whoever she was with. I saw a woman full of fear, full of fear. And, you know, I saw who I probably would have been without these rooms. And I walked over and I knelt down in front of her and I said, And, Mama, I want you to know I have forgiven you. I said, I have forgiven you for every hit, every lick, every scab, every drop of blood. I've forgiven you. I forgave you a long time ago. I said, do you remember that day I came to see you and I told you how sorry I was about things I had done to you? And we talked about what could I do to make things right. Steps eight and nine. She said, yeah, I remember. I said, well, I had already forgiven you that day, and I'm so sorry I didn't tell you. And that's why I talk about this. I'm not sure that I talk about forgiveness enough with sponsees and people that I work with. I'm not sure I read enough about it. I said, I already forgave you. I forgave you then. And I said, and I love you. I love you. I know that day that my mother gained a new sense of freedom. You know, I had seen her cry maybe maybe once in my life before that day. But we held each other and we cried together. And I know that day I gained a new sense of freedom too. We both did. Through forgiveness. Through forgiveness. I always wanted to learn more about my brother. My brother is more stoic than my mother, so it was very difficult. I tried to learn about science and talked about that, didn't get anywhere. Tried to talk about sports, didn't get anywhere. At that time at my home group, we had what we called a God can, G-O-D-C-A-N, and before each meeting, we'd pass it around, and and the purpose of it was if you'd been holding on to something and you were finally ready to give it to God, you'd write it on a piece of paper and put it in that can and let God have it. So finally one night I wrote my brother's name down, Glenn, and I put it in that can. And I told Debbie later, I said, well, I put Glenn's name in the God can. She said, I'm so glad because now God can work. Months and months went by. I forgot about the God can. We're all at my mother's house, my brother, his four daughters, his wife, my mom, me, Amanda. We're sitting around talking to us girls except for my mother or talking about books that we've been reading. And my brother pops up and he said, well, I've never read a book. Now, this time my brother's 56 years old. And I looked at him, you know, and I said, you've never read a book? And he said, no. I thought, whoa. And so I said, well, why not? He said, well, the letters just get all jumbled up. Wow. I said, well, Glenn, are you dyslexic? He said, I don't know what that is, but the letters just get all jumbled up. And his wife said, yeah, sometimes he brings me reports home from the hospital because he just can't read them, and I read it to him. College graduate. Wow, hospital administrative career. I looked at my mother. It was obvious she didn't know. Nobody ever knew till that day. So a week later, after asking permission from my brother, I'm standing at a bookstore buying my brother his first book on tape. And I'm standing there, and I'm thinking, what do you buy a 56-year-old man for his first book? I promise this has to do with recovery. Just hang with me. (laughs) So I bought him a James Patterson mystery, and I sent it to him. And about a week later, he called me, and he was crying. He he calls it reading. He said, I have just read my first book, and it was wonderful. When can you send me another one? He just about broke me that first year. They're kind of expensive. (laughs) And he was wanting them almost every week now. He was getting with it. He was reading. He had a lot of catching up to his wife. says, I've created a monster. They have books on tapes everywhere. They're falling out of closets. They're everywhere. (laughs) A few years after that, he called me one day. One of his daughters was home from college. He said, guess what I did today? I said, what? He said, Melissa and I went to the bookstore, and I bought my first book. On tape, you know, I bought my first book. I said, yay! And then a few years back, he has finally discovered the public library, and that's opened a whole new universe to him. <laughs> so what does that have to do with recovery? It's got everything to do with it. You see, my brother's never been in a room of recovery, ever. He says, thank you. Thank you for rocking his world. You know, you may be sitting out there today, and you may be thinking, you know, my program's just kind of blah, and my... Group's kind of blind. I don't think I'm going to go to the meeting tomorrow night. I'm just, I'm just probably not going to do it. You know, I've, I know what everybody's going to say. I know what they're going to do. I could run the meeting and say everybody's stuff and all by myself if I needed to at home, you know. Um, I'm not sponsoring anybody, so it's no big deal if I go or not. I'm just not going to do it. You know, we're all part of miracles. We are all part of profound events, whether we know it or not. The lady that came up with that idea for the God can, she never heard this story. Nor did her sponsor or her sponsor or her sponsor. Most of the women in that room, their sponsors and sponsors never heard this. But that didn't mean that it didn't happen. And that didn't mean that they weren't part of it. 
You know, if you go to your meeting tomorrow night, you may set up the chairs in such a way that two people will sit together that otherwise would never have sat together. And the things they say and the events may affect their families in positive ways for generation after generation after generation. And you will never know that. But you were part of that profound event. 42 years from today, a woman may stand behind a podium and talk about how you greeted her here this weekend. She may describe everything you were wearing. She may describe how your hair looks. She may describe how you held her hand. And you probably won't be here to hear that story. But it doesn't mean you're not part of it. Please keep coming. Please keep being part of profound, miraculous events that are happening. There are countless that have happened in this room. Please keep being part of it. In 2006, I was doing a 10-step inventory, and I realized I had never completely given God the part of my life that had to do with male-female relationships. I just didn't want to turn it over. I don't know why the wreckage is up to my chest now, but I'm still thinking I can do it better than God. But finally that day, I surrendered. I said, I'm done. I'm done. I can't do this. I don't know how to do it. I've never known how to do it. And I'm just going to learn how to be a happy, joyous, and free single woman in recovery. I'm going to go through all this wreckage. I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to get in therapy. I also want to change my spiritual life. God was a big kahuna in the sky, and I wanted him to be that. But I wanted to dig deeper with step 11. I wanted him to be my friend, too. I wanted him to be right next to me everywhere I went. I wanted to be able to talk with him, just like I'm talking with you right now. That's who I wanted God to be, too. So I changed my spiritual life. I started doing things different there. Uh, I said, I'm not going to go where men are looking for them. I'm not going to, oh, my friends wanted me to get on that love, love, love dot com and kissy, kissy, poo dot net and all that stuff. And I said, I'm not doing any of that. And I told God, I said, just in case you got somebody out there for me, you got to put him in front of my face and keep him there because I'm done. I'm just done. I got in therapy. I turned down dates. I didn't date for eight years. I went through stuff. I, I worked on my spiritual life. I just, I just did. And I became happy, joyous, and free, single in recovery. I did. Uh, March 8th of 2014, I was going to the Flint River Roundup in Albany, Georgia. I was going to host Bo T, and my daughter Amanda was hosting Shirley. And I got up that morning and packed up and was leaving my house. And I stopped, and I just said, I said, God, I just want you to know I've done everything you've wanted me to do, and I'm ready. And I shot to myself, got to, got to Albany, was rooming with a friend, Jean, and I told Jean, I said, I told God I've done everything you've wanted me to do, and I just want you to know I'm ready. And then I said, let's see how long it takes God. <laughs> well, Chip and I have a picture that was made less than 24 hours later by my daughter Amanda, he and I standing on stage, and a 14-year acquaintanceship friendship started changing that day. And six months later, we were married, and, and I have celebrated my first ever second wedding anniversary, third wedding anniversary, fourth wedding anniversary, fifth wedding anniversary, we're shooting for 50, and then when we get there, we're going to shoot for 50 more. And I have to tell you, this marriage thing is really pretty neat. I like it. I like it. We got married. I had 20, 20, uh, four years in, in Al-Anon, and he had 26 in AA. And my sponsor said, well, you're starting off with 50 years. I think this may have a chance. I think it may have a chance. I absolutely adore Chip. He is everything I ever imagined. You know, that God can. One time I wrote down on a piece of paper, I wish I'd made a copy, everything I wanted in a man. And you know, Chip's everything that was on that list and more. This young girl came up to me one time. She said, she was so cute, probably 22, 23. She said, oh, my God, Miss Angie, are you telling me I can't date for eight years? <laughs> I said, no, honey, I'm not telling you that. I don't know how much wreckage you had. I had a lot of wreckage to go through. But I am telling you this. Don't settle. Don't settle. We hear that still soft voice. I can't tell you how many times I settled in my life and in, in all different areas of my life. I don't know what miracles I never got to experience because I settled for less than. Don't settle. We have a miraculous God in this program. You know, he took a dyslexic man and brought him into my world of books. And here that eight years I was working on me, I thought I was waiting on God. God was waiting on me to do the work and tell him that I was ready. So do the work and then tell him you're ready and hang on. So now we're at step 12. I've had a spiritual awakening. Not because I go to meetings, not because I set up chairs in my home group, not because I do service work. I've had a spiritual awakening because I have worked the steps with a sponsor. Now all that other stuff's important. 
But it didn't get me the spiritual awakening. Working the steps with my sponsor did. Now what do I do with it? I tell you, being being uh, spiritual in an hour meeting is, I can do that. It's the other 23 hours of the day that I struggle sometimes, you know? So a few years back, I started looking. I heard Sandy Beach say one time that, that his goal was to be the least disturbed person in the room. And if he was disturbed, it meant only one of two things. He either had to forgive or he had to make amends. Only one of those two. Well, I started testing that out because I thought, yeah, I hear you. And so when something would happen, of course, my go-to was, oh, i got to forgive. But, you know, if I'd pause and wait, just, just, just wait a little while, I could almost always find an amends in there that I need to make. And so I've kind of taken that and, and adopted this motto that I guess now is going to be it for the rest of my life, and, and it goes like this. Angie, be kind. Just be kind. Be kind to people on Facebook and other social media. Be kind to people that don't vote like you. Be kind to people that don't look like you. Be kind to people that don't talk like you. Be kind to people that don't believe like you. Just be kind. I've learned sometimes it takes a lot of courage and a lot of strength to be kind. But that's my goal now, every day. While we've been here this weekend, there are meetings going on all over the world. Some I know about are. There are some people that speak in a field in Africa because it's a safe place for them to meet. There's some folks meeting in a big cathedral in London, England. Some folks meeting in a kitchen, around a kitchen table in Perrysburg, Ohio. People meeting at that little red brick building in Level Plains, Alabama. And they're all doing what we're doing. They're all sharing their language of the heart with each other. I'm Angie and I appreciate you letting me share my language of the heart with you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.